Hey everyone, Matt here, another edition of Ask Ron. Ron, how's your day going so far? Man, I'm good. I'm sitting here in my home office as usual, getting ready to go on a trip over to Live Oak, Florida to a, an event called Huluween, which has somewhere between 25,000 and 50,000 people coming in there. It's an RV park, but there'll be tents in every square foot you can put them and you know, music nonstop, none of which I want to listen to. <laughs> I uh, I just go over there to see the people because there's a bunch of weird people there and and uh, a lot of uh, other things going on, really cool lights, light shows and so forth. But uh, it's not meant for old people, but there'll be a lot of us there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ron, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little jealous that you're going. It should be a fun time. Oh. This is probably my fifth year. Fifth year, yeah. I'll make it one of these years. All right. We have a few questions for today, so let's go ahead and jump right into them. Okay. First one we have is from Phil in Ohio. Phil or Bill? Phil. Phil, okay. Hey, Phil. Phil says, for many of the gold club leads I submit to your VAs, the VA is not able to reach the seller. That's right. As as you recommend, I still call them. Now, do you have a script to use for a seller that has not been contacted before? Well, I didn't recommend that you call them, Phil. I recommend that you text them and get and tell them you're interested in buying their house but cannot reach you and let them text you back. The ones who text you back are good quality uh, customers because literally they're calling you now. Um, but I'm, if we call them three times and can't reach them, probably ain't going to do you any good to call them as well. So, uh, you know, there's good uses of your time and not. But you text them and they don't reply, it's time to quit. Doesn't mean you can't follow up with your emails in your, in your dream system because you don't have to do anything but set them up once. Uh, and there will be deals come from the follow-up regardless of what happens today. But they are on my bottom end of suspects, not prospects. And just so you know the numbers, when we furnish you leads at the Gold Club. They come from people who advertise online that they have a house for sale. These are the lowest quality leads out there. You want to you want to focus on getting sellers to call you. And I have a whole list of ways to do that. I tell you, my favorite way is when I just pay somebody to go generate and qualify the lead, and I just pay them for the lead. And that, instead of doing things that may or may not generate quality leads, I'd like I'd rather pay for them as I go. Now, these leads are going to cost anywhere from $50 to $300 a lead, but so what? I'll take 10 of them over 100 of the uh, less qualified leads any day because my, my, my uh, uh, students that are running active businesses out there are closing somewhere between one and seven and one and 20 of those leads. So if I had to pay $150 for 20 leads and have 3,000 bucks in it and get me a deal that makes me a minimum of $15,000, it's not rocket science to me, but hey, I understand you're working on a very small, slim budget and just getting started and don't have any money to invest in your training. But then you just have to do what you can do that don't require that kind of money going out. But again, you got to work harder because there's things you can do. You can run ads, you can run free ads online, you can put out signs. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I teach you to do in my boot camp that cost little or no money. But my favorite is when somebody else is doing all the work and all I got to do is send it over to VA to make to fill out the sheet and I make one closing call to a, a, at least a better qualified lead. It just short, uh, shortcuts the whole front end business of generating leads. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, if you can. All right, our next question is from Robert up in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Robert hey, Matt, before I forget it, mm -hmm. why don't we do a, a seminar a short, you know, short seminar. Let me go over some lead sources for our folks. Uh, now, if you've been to my if you've been to my Quick Start School, they're they're in your manual, all right. But I understand that many of you like to get started and can't afford to come to the Quick Start School. So, uh, make a note, and I'll I'll do that um, in a very 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 near future. Put it out there free to our to our uh, members. That's a great idea. Let us make a note of that. We'll uh, we'll tackle that next week. In fact, we can use that same lesson for people that are registered for the boot camp but haven't arrived yet. Help them set up some lead sources before they come. There we go. I like it. I like it. All right. All right. Robert has two questions and he's from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. 
His first question is, I saw a mobile home park that I'm interested in getting, but not too sure what I should offer on it. They own it free and clear and only about 55% of it is filled all with tenant owned homes. How do I figure out the Mayo for this? You don't use Mayo on commercial properties. You have to use a formula predicated on a net operator. If it's 45%, uh, I, I, did he say they were? 55% of it was tenant owned. Did he? Mm -hmm. now, what's the occupancy on this park? He didn't say, did he? No. Okay. No, I think it's only 55% filled. Yeah. First thing, is it offered by an agent? If it is, then they should have all the facts right there. They should even publish a cap rate. Uh, and I definitely want to know the vacancy because obviously I got to have an upside. So I'm not going to buy a mobile home park that's fully, fully occupied unless, unless the seller is really desperate. Uh, and uh, so I, I can't answer that question without spending. You know what? I got a commercial property boot camp coming up. I think what you ought to do is get in that. What's the dates on that? December something here in Jacksonville. Yes. And, and we're going to telecast it. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, what's the date? You know? Yep. December 7th to the 9th. Okay. Uh, it probably takes me an hour and a half to answer your, qu your question. Oh, shut up. I'm, this is serious. <laughs> I didn't talk to you. He's dropping. Uh, yeah, he's driving on me. Okay. It probably takes me an hour and a half to answer that question because it's it's math and it's it's it's, uh, it's not just one formula you can plug in like the Mayo formula. It doesn't work that way. It's all predicated on the net operating income. And then if you think it's low, you have to project the future net operating income so you can project the future value. And even from that, you can determine if you ever want to refinance it, what, what, how much money you get out of it, and what it's worth after you turn it around. But honestly, if it doesn't need turn around, I mean, I'm not telling you it has to be in horrible shape and almost all vacant, but there has to be an upside. And usually that is in either vacancies or they're charging extremely low rents now. So, um, by the way, that would be a great project for you to bring to the commercial boot camp if you bring all the facts on it, which are right online, probably if it's listed. And we are very interested in mobile home parks right now. So you might find uh, the buyer, uh, me, uh, <laughs> right right there in class. But uh, if you're not, uh, you know what? I don't mind taking a look at it, though, before he comes. But I'm trying to figure out where he, where he sends it. Uh, you're going to have to send it to um, Tish, T-I-S-H, at LeGrandProjects.com. But don't send me the information on this mobile home park if you don't have the financial, okay? I got to know the income and I got to know the outcome. I got to know how many vacancies there are and what kind of shape this park is in and everything you can glean. And I don't want, I don't want 20 pages of anything. Okay. Just send me the bare facts on this and I'll break my own rule and take a look at it for you. Uh, whether you come to the boot camp or not, because even if I, if we buy a mobile home park and uh, you're not part of it, then we pay a, a big finder's fee. So uh, if nothing else, you learn a lot from the exercise. Nice. Don't tell anybody I did that now because I absolutely do not work with people. I haven't been there to the commercial boot camp. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Robert's next question is also on mobile home parks. He says, how do you inspect a mobile home park? Do you use the same people as you would a single family home? And if not, where do I find one that does this kind of inspection? You. <laughs> Inspect a mobile home park means is the park here? What does it look like? The, what, what does it need? You, you're the best one to inspect it, but I don't, you don't do that till after it's under contract. So you're gonna see pictures of it and you're gonna do all your due diligence before you ever even worry about going to and inspect it. And inspecting it is actually after most of my due diligence is completely done and it looks like it's a go. Only then am I gonna go inspect it. As far as mobile homes go, uh, if they're trashed, honestly, in my opinion and in my, Friends that are in the business opinion, they just need to be removed from the property, not try to renovate wobbly boxes because they're just constant renovations, constant. And you just can't go down to Lowe's and buy the stuff to fix a, a mobile home. So uh, inspecting is pretty easy. What does it look like? What's around it? What kind of condition is it in? What does it need? Uh, what do the mobile homes look like? If I'm going to look at a 75 unit mobile home park, I sure ain't going in 75 mobile homes. I can tell you that. I'd rather have a root canal, <laughs> but, but I, can, I can easily figure out what I'm dealing with. And from that, knowing that I'm probably going to just take all of them off of there in time, uh, uh, I don't much care about the mobile homes, to be honest with you, because they're not going to be a very big price, uh, part of the purchase price anyway. And, uh, and I've even um, seen some of my 
some of my students uh, literally give them away just to get them off the off the off the site. Uh, I'm in the mobile home park business, not in the mobile home business. I hate mobile homes. Okay, I hate them. They they depreciate fast. They don't appreciate. Whereas the income from those pads is constant, and those people aren't going anywhere. It costs them thousands of dollars to move that mobile home. They're bringing their own in there, and I'm not saying we. We can't do parks with some homes on it, and that's not a bad thing. But I don't. Uh, if it's a trashy mobile home park, it needs to be detrashed, and that's the only way to turn it around. That's right. All right. Moving on to the next question, Frederick. He does not list a state, but he has two questions. Frederick says, "Is the creation of an LLC recommended? I heard that the house is placed in some sort of trust." The house is placed in a land trust. And since you're watching this, uh, there's land trust lessons right here on your Gold Club site. And the land trust documents are here on your Gold Club sites under resources. And if you go up in the search box and put up the word land trust, there's probably more coming up than you want to read. I remember at least there's an hour to hour 15 minute seminar just on land trust uh, on the Gold Club site. And I think that one's under training. Yeah, more than you need and yes you will place the property in a trust and the trust will probably be owned by an llc another big question is who owns that and that's another lesson that's on the gold club site which takes probably at least 30 minutes to answer there's definitely quite a few lessons resources yeah information for a land trust on the cover all this in my quick start school but you know uh, you probably already know that anyway, if you're watching this. Incidentally, we're doing one here in Jacksonville this month. Uh, I bet you don't know the dates of that either, do you? Huh? Give me one second, I'll tell you. Okay. Right here in Jacksonville, this is not gonna be televised. This is only gonna be live and in person and we got quite a crowd coming already. Oh, here we go, November 15th to the 18th. 15 through 18, Quick Start School. Um, if you really wanna get trained in this business, you need to call our office and get the details on that. We've got a whole bunch of discounts. We can finance it for you. Uh, I don't, and, and, and we don't, you know, we don't pull a credit report on you. So we call in and get the facts on it because that's the beginning of your multimillionaire status right there. And while you're in Jacksonville, uh, well, if you get a chance, you can come over to our office and see all you people up on our walls everywhere you look, uh, testimonial letters. And uh, frankly, that's a fraction of them. We, we haven't hung most of them, but there's plenty of them up there. So uh, just taking that trip and looking at that wall, you cannot you cannot convince yourself that this stuff won't work or it won't work here or it won't work for you. Because mostly everybody on that wall started with absolutely nothing and no knowledge of real estate. Some of them have become multi, multi, multi millionaires in a few years. In fact, I got one up there where a guy has topped the $100 million mark of commercial property that he's bought since he came to my commercial property boot camp. Wow. Yeah, I love right the testimony of Wall. He's the, he's the one guy out of the hundreds that actually listen. <laughs> and see what it gets him. Yes, kidding. Most of the guys listen. They just don't do anything. <clears throat> uh, All right, go ahead. I'm insulting our listener. <laughs> All right. Frederick's last question is, how are the attorney fees calculated? Are they partners with the closing company? Attorney fees? Mm -hmm. Now they're not calculated. They should be. They should be um, uh, agreed upon prior to using them. For example, our attorney here in Florida charges us six hundred and fifty dollars to do a closing. That's attorney's fee. Now, of course, there's still going to be a title search, and there's certainly going to be some other small fees that they make up to extract money out of you. But that's normal. Been that way forever. Uh, but the attorney's fee here is six fifty. I don't care where you're at. It shouldn't be much more than that because. If, if it's much more than that, you're, you're not using a real estate closing attorney, most likely. You're using an attorney that does an occasional real estate closing. That's not where, if they ask for a retainer, wrong attorney. That's the only question you need to know because the attorney's fees paid at closing. Now, there's an exception in, in Texas. If you're selling a house to own, with owner financing in Texas, you have to have an attorney to close. It's actually the law now, which is good, in my opinion. Same is true, though, for New York or New Jersey. You have to have a, an attorney to close your transaction. And people are always saying, but we use title companies. Well, I do too, but not to close. I use them to check the title and issue title insurance when I need it. Uh, you have, must have an attorney involved in every transaction you do other than all cash. And honestly, it's smart, smartly smarter for you to even use them in all cash. Just remember this, the title company does not represent you, okay? They represent their underwriter, okay? Your attorney represents you. 
make sure all the documents are in place and you're doing everything legal. And you'll learn a lot in the process of what you can and cannot do. If you get a good, skilled real estate closing attorney, you won't close more than two or three of them and you will get it and probably know more than most of the investors in your area. And you'll learn what the closing costs are, which you absolutely must learn pretty early in the game, depending on what state you're in. Like in Texas, they're practically nothing. Arizona, they're practically nothing. Uh, not true in some states. Some states are extremely high. In Florida, I'm somewhere in the middle, but at least I know how to calculate them. You only have to learn that once. Right. All right. Our next question is from Justin, who is in Texas. Oh, yeah. See, I knew he was going to be there, Justin. <laughs> With my Texas speech. That's right. right. Right on cue. Justin says, can you do lease options in Texas? Yes, you can. And I've been preaching for years. You can't. I was wrong. I should have got a hold of the right attorney. And the right attorney is Scott Horn in Dallas. Scott Horn. He does hundreds of them. He is a real estate attorney. There are restrictions. You cannot lease, you cannot option it for more than six months. And you better have an attorney involved because if that, that termination don't get issued in six months properly, uh, then you are violating the rules. And they literally, if you don't do it correctly in Texas, they can put you back in the position you were in when you met them. It means all the money goes back and all the rent gets refunded to them. That'll be a bad hair day. Uh, the thing is, it costs about $4,000 to do that in Texas, but because they have several parties involved in it, but it doesn't matter because uh, the people who are doing it are passing the cost on to the tenant buyers anyway. Uh, all of my attorney's fees, uh, all my closing costs are paid by tenant buyers when I put them in a house. Uh, Texas just to be, it seems to be on the upper end because of the laws they have there concerning selling on lease option. But you can, and you can collect the non-refundable deposit. Now, that doesn't mean they have to move in six months. It's just that their option expires on day 159. You can leave them in the house as long as you want. And there's no law that says you can't give them credit for that when and if they ever, ever want to buy. So you can do it in Texas as long as you understand the rules and use a good attorney to close. All right. That's really good information to have. There you go, Justin. Well, most of your Texas attorneys will tell you no. Right. It's actually is an advantage if you think about it, because most investors in Texas think you cannot do lease options. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, our next question is from Marina, and she does not give her state. But Marina says, what if they decide not to buy the property after the two-year option? You mean they move? You, you get your family together and have a party. <laughs> because they just walked away from your big old option deposit, and you get to go collect another one without having to buy another house. See, I know it's hard for you to internalize, but in my world... I don't care if they move or not. I'd rather they not buy and kill my golden goose. So if they want to move, let them move. Look, I'm not. I'm doing everything I said I was going to do. Uh, and they just decide not to buy. And for a lot of reasons, people decide not to buy after they've been there a couple of years. For example, divorce, um, health, uh, moving out of town, uh, reduction of income, and there's a longer list. For example, I'm at least option one to one uh, guy one time, and nine months later, he said, "I got to move." This guy gave me a, I forgot, well, I think it was a $25,000 deposit. Oh. And it turns out that his wife caught him living in another house with another woman part time. And that was the end of my lease option deal. Oh. <laughs> and probably the end of his life, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all kinds of reasons people don't buy it. But the truth is, most of them do not do what it takes to go get qualified for a loan. Because if they come to us, they're not qualified to buy or they wouldn't come to us. They have a credit issue, they have a debt ratio issue, or they have a proof of income or whatever issue they have. But any of that can be cleaned up with time. And two years is way more than enough time to get it all. But they just don't do it. They don't take the initiative to do it. And that, that, that's on them. I quit, I quit worrying about that a long time ago. Uh, am I taking advantage of them? <laughs> no, I'm not taking advantage of them. I'm giving them a great benefit to go in a house, live in it, control it, buy it when they want and give them plenty of time to fix what's broke. And, and that's the only way they're going to get a house because they can't go to bank and qualify. And yet most of them just won't do it. So I quit feeling sorry for them about, I don't know, maybe 35 years ago. <laughs> that's right. All right, we're up to our last question, Ron. 
And this one's from Leslie, who does not give her state either. But Leslie, Leslie. says, okay. guys, give your states because that has an effect on my answer. All right. Yeah, that's right. Different rules in different states, like the one I just talked about in Texas. Mm -hmm. Need the state. All right. Leslie says, don't you have to give the deposit back when they buy? <laughs> I do, I do, I do give it back in a way, but I don't come to closing with a check. The closing agent sees that they've given me fifty thousand dollars or whatever. They just credit that on the closing statement, so it comes right off their down payment as well as their purchase price. So in a way, I'm giving it back, but I'm not bringing the money to closing because I've long since spent it. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of family living on my property. It takes a lot of money to support all these families living. On my <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I do have a bunch of families living here, but I don't support them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, Ron. I think that's that all I have for today. Yep. Okay. All right, guys. Listen, I I, I, I don't know what to tell you uh, to convince you to get uh, to my quick start school, but I'll tell you this. You can sit there for two days, and if you don't think it's for you, you can leave and get a full refund. I don't know how easier to make it, that decision for you than that. And we're not going to quiz you. You don't have to fill out a form and you don't have to. There's no restocking fee or any of that crap. If you're out, you're out. OK, I understand. If you sit with me for two days and you want out, that's probably the right decision. All right. Uh, you won't, but you have that right. Uh, come see me. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm not hard to get to. The weather is always you should see the weather out here today. Beautiful. All you folks up north, you should see the weather out here today. You couldn't ask for more perfect weather anywhere in the United States than we have right here in Jacksonville, Florida today. And in fact, if you come down here and you live in the north, now you'll see why the northerners are flooding to Florida. OK, <laughs> a lot of it has to do with the weather because you're getting into some nasty weather up there right now. I remember when I moved from Ohio to Florida, I moved in the middle of January. I mean, it was horrible. And I went out and I, I was I had hogs at a little 15 acre farm. I had to break the ice in the bathtub to where the hogs drink. Oh. I'm pounding on that ice with a hammer, and I'm thinking to myself, you idiot, what are you doing up here? You're a Floridian for crying out loud. I was up there for 10 years. Three months later, I moved to Florida, okay? And hey, in case you guys don't know it, you folks that live up north and, and, and endure these nasty winters, did you know that you don't have to live there? Okay, but you better hurry because there aren't many houses left in Florida. All right, no. That's for sure. See you guys next week.